Hello, everybody, and welcome to God Quest. I'm your host, Miles Young, and I'm delighted you took the time to join us on the podcast today. God Quest is about exploring what God is doing in our lives and in the earth, and we're on a quest to find that and do the will of God. And I am thrilled to have someone very special to me personally, and that is none other than Dr. Nathaniel Wilson. We are delighted you're on God Quest today. Well, thank you today, Pastor Young. It is good to be here, and um, I'm looking forward to talking about some of these things that are pertinent, and I think they're going to be interesting. We have been uh, talking, uh, Dr. Wilson, over the last few weeks. We've talked to uh, a variety of ministries. In that discussion was the fivefold ministry. We talked about the miraculous. We talked about how the gifts of the Spirit are in operation, and uh, the, the dimensions of what we would call some of the, the more mystical side. But the real thing that I think is underneath all of that is all of those strange and mysterious giftings and gifts that everybody wants to have imparted to them come out of a book called the Bible. <laughs> yes, sir. And that's where the foundation of these, these things come from. And I think that we could all use some visits back to the old black book because this hunger and interest in the things miraculous and gifting, those foundations and truths are in the Word of God. So I guess I'm saying all that to say we're going to talk about the Bible today. Yes, sir. Well, I'm eager to do so, and I think that this will be hopefully a profitable discussion. Yes. One of the the unique things... Uh, about our discussion today is not only are you a well-known Bible scholar, uh, a Bible teacher and preacher for many, many years. Uh, At one time, you were the international radio uh, preacher for the Harvest Time Worldwide Broadcast. I remember as a a child growing up listening to that program, and only God knows the impact eternally we'll Mm -hmm. find out that it had. Uh, And then through the years, uh, known as a well-known Bible teacher, camp meetings, conferences, and then founded a university. I was there back in the old days of Patton at the Rock and now Wilson University. Uh, the board named that after you, which is kind of cool to have a university named after you. I know I know you weren't too thrilled about no. it, but the board <laughs> voted in spite of right. your opposition. Uh, but I, I use all of that to, to kind of provide the qualifiers for the those people that may be watching that may may not know. But you are also the editor of a recent production in the last few years called the Premier Study Bible, of which I have a copy in my hand that is still in the case. This is the second edition of the Premier Study Bible, and we'll get into we'll get into this in a, in a little while. And I'd like to hear about the the thinking behind all of this, and we'll talk about that. But I think a good place to start is throw some stuff to our audience about how you view the Word of God as more than just a a resource for preaching. What do you think the impact and the importance of this book we call the Bible plays, obviously, in preachers like you and I, but but for the average man or woman of faith? What what role does the Bible play? Well, that's an interesting question, Pastor, and um, I think that the Uh, dichotomy that's often seen in different uh, churches, denominations, groups, um, doesn't take into account everything about Christianity. Christianity is not simply a mind religion. Uh, By that I mean you can't just read the Bible and Uh, use a scientific method to decide whether you think it's true or not and look at it from the detachment of uh, an objective observer, you can't do that and be a real Christian. Okay. Um, And so there is a form of Christianity that is not something that is bad, that is uh, encased in Scripture. And scripture is what guides uh, the spiritual side of Christianity. The spiritual side of Christianity might be thought of as a river flowing and the 
word, the Bible, which tells us about that spiritual side and also talks about uh, all the practical sides of life and how it fits within the context of a Christian life. Uh, that is the banks of this river. And if you take the banks away in Christianity, you have extremism, you have, uh, if it's a river, it becomes a marsh, which breeds all kinds of unwanted things and things that are toxic to life itself. So on the other hand, if you don't have the flow of the Spirit, churches that reject the flow of the Spirit, uh, they have a dry riverbed. <laughs> the, the, the water of life, Jesus himself talks about there's a river of living water flowing out of you. And so um, uh, the, both of these dynamics are there. So I think what that leads us to, without getting in too deep, is that uh, we live Christian life in a polarity uh, between word and spirit. We live in a polarity between form, which we get through the word, and uh, dynamics, which is what you were talking about earlier, the gifts of the spirit and the moving yeah. of the spirit and so forth. So, and that's held in tension. And like any polarity, like a battery, you have a positive and negative, they repel each other. And so there's, you have people over here that are repelled by a move of the spirit and you have people over here that's repelled by somebody that's always uh, trying to exegete the Bible verse by verse instead of letting it flow with everything it has to give to us. So I think that um, uh, that's a core understanding and it's a large and long discussion, but it's a core understanding that uh, maybe this is an easier way to save it, say it, Christianity is not all cognitive. You can't get it all with cognition, like in your mind. Um, it's not all affective either, affections, affective. So it's both, it's cognitive and affective, and you have to hold that tension. Thus, if you say, well, which one holds primacy of place in terms of giving the church its ultimate direction. Well, the word is the one that holds the primacy of place. Otherwise, you have people out here saying all kinds of things that God told me this and God told yeah. me that, and you have, no, you have nothing to, to, to balance and judge that by. So, so, so the word is an extremely important thing. So the word, I mean, as we, as we made mention of earlier, the word is filled with all of these, you call them affective or dynamic things. But the word becomes the sounding board or the balancing that keeps that polarity in place from people getting squirrely. So we're able to check those dynamic things. How does it measure up to the word of God? Yeah, absolutely. So I have, I have seen this struggle in churches. I was an evangelist for five and a half years. I've pastored for a number of years. I've, I've had saints come to church, maybe from other backgrounds. And you see this polarity. You see saints that that may have come from a very dynamic environment that was, you know, uh, just everything spirit, spirit, spirit. But then the first trial or challenge that comes along, there's no foundation. Yep. And then you also can see where there's people that were foundation, 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 but no one ever drives by a building site and says, oh, look how beautiful the foundation. Those foundations are, are built to build things upon. And so I, I like this polarity you're talking about is that the Word of God provides the balance for these things that we're trying to press into. W what do you think the, the pastor, the preacher, the man of God that's leading, the woman of God that's leading people in their walk with faith, what would you encourage them to do related specifically to the Word of God? Because that's something everybody can do. Well, yeah, and the first thing, that I would say is that whether you understand what you're reading or not, you ought to read several chapters every day. And uh, I mean, a minimum of at least one chapter, but if a person set a goal of reading five chapters a day, it wouldn't take very long. And become acquainted with the Bible. Learning the Bible is a little bit, and there is no perfect likeness or metaphor for learning the Bible, but learning the Bible is a little bit like learning to play the piano. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you, you know, you can learn a little bit and, and it's, it's satisfying, but you also at the same time learn how much you don't know. And, and so there's, there's, it's a pro progressive thing where you continue to go deeper in the word. Here's one of the things. I am overtly Pentecostal. Okay. And I'd be glad to spend 50 podcasts talking about why I'm overtly <laughs> pod, uh, Pentecostal. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, by the same token, I think that there's things in the word of God that are so that have to be received here before they can be rejoiced over here. And um, they are so profound and so revelatory that many people never get to know what those things are. And, and every spiritual blessing cannot be gained just by worship. There are spiritual blessings that come by line upon line and precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Here, there, here a little and there a little. And, and, and finally, a person sees something in the Word of God that has uh, a, an enormous impact upon their life. Now, that certainly doesn't negate the other side. So all the churches that don't want a move of God, uh, if you raised your hand in it, they would go ballistic. Or, or if you said amen, they'd say you're going to have to leave if you don't be quiet. Um, all of those kinds of things are just, uh, is just, in my opinion, people that have just very little understanding of Christianity. They don't even have, even though they may be Bible scholars, they don't have a very good understanding of the Bible either because they've learned everything they've learned on the cognitive side and nothing on the affective side. So, so well said. The writer said, with the mind, I serve the Lord. So there is this, there is a dimension of living for God that is very closely connected to what shapes my thinking and what I'm allowing to shape my thinking. And the Word of God is, I can't say that every time I take the Word of God out and read it that I get goosebumps like I do when I'm worshiping and jumping and shouting. And, but it's, it's that Word of God, we talk about line upon line, precept, but we also go from glory to glory. And for me, personally, I have, I have found myself reading maybe difficult passages in my personal devotion. I'm a, yeah. I'm a personal Bible reader, uh, very active. It's part of my daily routine. And there are times that I've done that for years. There have been times there were passages that, even as a preacher, they, I got bogged down in them. And I'm like, and that day I just kind of grind through it. And then I walk into a midweek Bible study. And the pastor preaches, or the visiting evangelist preaches, and wouldn't you know it, they take the very text that I got bogged down yeah. in, or I lost interest in, and all of a sudden they start preaching it, and it's like, whoa. And I just moved from glory to glory. Yeah, that's right. I just learned, oh, that's what that was talking about. Or, or I was reading something in Ezekiel, and then somebody starts preaching out of Revelation, and I see a connection. And I think this is where reading the Bible, even when you're not feeling the glory and you're not in the wave of God's power, you're doing something to you. Yeah, definitely. So let's be honest. The Bible, especially in King James English, sometimes is difficult for us. And somebody said, you know, what's your favorite? For me personally, I really enjoy the King James Version. For me, I find it easier to... Uh, memorized because of the poetic nature it's almost artsy at some point and so it's easier to tie uh there's but i do other read other translations or interpretation or commentaries uh, and i just want people reading the word of god but you have been part uh the lead uh your vision was to see an apostolic study bible from a pentecostal perspective uh and you were you were the lead uh I think technically what would it be, chief editor, editor-in-chief, the editor of the Premier Study Bible, and there was a whole host of people. Uh, I had the privilege of working uh, by invitation, thank you for the invitation, of working on the Psalms, which I felt akin to. Uh, and you put together and your team put together the Premier Study Bible. And, uh, yeah, I guess you could say we're doing a commercial for the Premier Study Bible, but really that's not what this is about. I want to use this as an example of... The Bible can be difficult, especially for someone coming to faith where it's new that hasn't the background of being a churchgoer. Yep. 
And it can be difficult when you're inundated with false teachers on the internet that twist everything. And what you and your team put together, uh, excellent. It was done so well. Uh, Thomas Nelson, am I correct? Thomas Nelson Publishers mm -hmm. uh, uh, helped in this. And you put this together, and with this, your team, you put together commentaries, chain references. Uh, I even think there was the first edition. There was an Africa edition that talked about the great Pentecostal yeah. explosion there. But what I see the best benefit of this Bible is, as a preacher, I have, I have literally hundreds of Bibles, commentaries. But where I see the power of this Bible, Dr. Wilson, is that the average person, can take this Bible and navigate through challenging places in Scripture that are difficult to understand. So in leading this, what was, what was in your thing? I know that's part of your heartbeat because we've talked about it, but, but it's not everybody that just decides to, I mean, this was a, a massive undertaking. Mm -hmm. Talk about the Premier Study Bible, why you felt it was important, and where you see it going, and what, what is the impact of, a, of an apostolic study Bible? Well, first of all, when we say apostolic, we are talking about an apostolic Pentecostal uh, viewpoint from which uh, the project is uh, set in motion. And the reason for that is, is because, so we'll stir up a little controversy here, <laughs> is that I, you cannot find a church in the New Testament that was not Pentecostal. So why would we want to be anything else? I don't get it. <laughs> okay, all right, we're just, people are joining in now to yeah. argue. Yeah. All right. No, I, I mean, I don't get it. Somebody says, well, that was just for them. But that's not true. The fastest growing social or, <clears throat> or religious or political the fastest growing thing in the world today is Pentecostalism. And you can, sit, you can sit there all day and say, well, there are, it's all just a bunch of gibberish, but 10% of the world's population now, if you ask them what they are, they'd tell you they're Pentecostal, of it's almost growing. 10%. It's That's growing. Right. And it's growing, and it's been growing, according to one researcher, 8% a year since yeah. 1970. So at, at that rate in 2032, there'll be more Pentecostals than there are people. <laughs> so... So obviously that's that's not going to happen. But uh, I, I'm, I'm and just all the saying, covenant theologians are saying amen. Yeah, right now. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm I'm just saying um, uh, why 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 would you want to be anything else? Now, what you can do is you could jump up and go point at extremism and say, well, here's examples of well, we unfortunately we could do that with anybody. Yeah. I don't care who you are, what denomination, or what background, or what you, what reformed uh, area you came out of in the Reformation, you could do that. But so, what do we really have? And to, here's that leads directly to the answer to your question. What we really have is in the front of this. There is a little article written. I wrote it, and it gives the four premises that this uh, Premier Study Bible is based upon. One of those premises is there is no more pristine um, model of the perfect church than the original church on the day of Pentecost and in the Bible. Now we know that there was imperfect people, but this is why you have what you call restorationist is that virtually every denomination that started since the way back in the 1500s with Martin Luther and even before that uh, started in an attempt to get back to biblical Christianity. Mm -hmm. That's what it was. They, the, the, the deal was they would read something in the Bible and they say, we want to get back to biblical Christianity. We want to reform. Yeah, that's right. The perfecting church. Yeah, that's right. That, so it, it's been formed. Everybody concedes that, but we want to get back to it. So each one of these took steps towards that. <clears throat> and that should be acknowledged and appreciated, <clears throat> excuse me, because that was built upon each time. Well, but when you go to the Bible, it's pretty simple to see that the church started with dynamics mm -hmm. that was based in a long line of form, that is teaching by Jesus Christ and, uh, and by the Old Testament prophets. And they all, they prophesied that this experience was going to come, the re reception of the Holy Spirit, which was the foundational 
dynamic in the formation of the church. Isaiah prophesied it in 28 and 11. Joel prophesied it in 2, 28 and 29. Ezekiel prophesied it in Ezekiel 37. Uh, I mean, we could go on. Jeremiah in 31, 33. Uh, John the Baptist, uh, he'll baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. Jesus himself breathed on him and said, So it wasn't just some, this, uh, this aberration of no, some dynamic no. thing that just exploded. There was, there was form oh, to this dynamic There is no impact. question. There is no question. There, is, there, there may not be any prophecies in the Old Testament other than the coming of Jesus Christ himself that is more validated than the reception of the Holy Spirit. So why people today would want to negate that, mm -hmm. and, and, and I, I want to be real kind when I say this, but why would someone say, well, you can't have the Holy Ghost, it, I, you know, if they've never had it? Yeah. I mean, I'd say to you, you know, you at least ought to see if you could receive what the Bible said you could in Acts 2, 38 and 39, when he said it's unto you and your children and, and all those that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Every second that's passed since then is a new record of how far off it's been. We believe that this book is prescriptive and not just descriptive. Yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. so that Acts account and this, this spirit baptism was not just given in that as a description of what happened. We believe it was a pattern and a prescription of how the church is to function. There's no question. If not, then how could you take any of it and say it's a pattern? Uh, you know, yeah. and <clears throat> excuse me, most denominations are formed around the description of uh, many of them are formed around uh, the form of church government they have, like the Presbyterian is a Presbyterian form of government and Congregationalist is a Congregational form of government and so forth. Not all of them, but many of them. Well, where do you get that? Well, they would say, well, we get that out of the Bible. Presbyterian, we have presbyters. And that we get that, out. Well, how, well, how can you take that out of the Bible and not take the rest of it, you know? So um, anyway, from that viewpoint, so uh, that, that is the grid laid across the idea yep. of a Pentecostal apostolic that's where it comes approach. From. That's where it comes from. That, is, that undergirds all of it because when we talk about the early church being the perfect model, the, the, one of our premises also is, is that that model is the only model that was ever given and there is no other model. So where does all of this stuff come from that says, well, that model was good, but it's not like that anymore. So that's, that's not true. And uh, the reason, one reason I'm adamant about it is because I've received the Holy Ghost. Yep. The, the, we call it the Holy Ghost because it's the spirit of a departed one that came back to help you or haunt you. <laughs> so, but it. you know, it, it's the Holy Spirit. So, so why, why, why would someone, it just blows my mind. Why would they fight against that and say that's not scriptural? Well, Peter got it and Paul got it and the promise was all of us could have it. So I just decided I'm going to believe the Bible instead of everybody else. It's refreshing to, to, to navigate through scriptures with the commentary provided being from this background of thought of apostolic Pentecostal theology. Uh, I remember being, I was with a group of men and I remember a man weeping and he held up a book and he said, this is the first time I've ever held a book of apostolic theology. Yep. Uh, and for me as a pastor, I have the benefit of years of ministry training, uh, influences in my life of powerful teachers and preachers and scholars in the word of God Many people don't have that opportunity. They, they come to God, they experience salvation, and uh, their preacher does his best, uh, and, and maybe he grew up in a church. And, and I don't mean in any way to negate the importance of a pastor or a preacher because we, we've got to have that. But for a saint, a, a, as a pastor, I don't have time to answer every saint's question, mm -mm. right? Even, uh, even the greatest among us can't answer all those mm -mm. questions. And this is a wonderful way that a team of Bible scholars, I don't even know how many, I think they're listed in there, some of the, some of the premier Bible yeah. teachers uh, alive today poured into this. Lots of research. And to be able to give this, I gave this to a man 
in Africa. And he had no way of coming at this point to get a higher education. He didn't have the money, didn't have a visa, so hungry. And he's trying to navigate through all of the different ideas of, of what Scripture means. And when he got his premier study Bible, it was like lights went on mm. and a fulfillment in his faith that I just want to say thank you to your vision for putting this together. And it's a wonderful tool. And if you, if you do not have a premier study Bible, I would encourage you to get one because it's going to, it's going to be a great, a great path of study. Dr. Wilson, I think the crazier the world gets and the more access we have to internet uh, and knowledge, uh, the more we need a solid foundation of the Word of God to help, to help create that foundation for these, these issues we're going to face. So thank you again for your work, and I encourage everybody to do that. Uh, before we go, you, you have just launched, I believe this week, you just launched All Things Apostolic on the Internet. Yeah. Tell us about All Things Apostolic and, and what does that look like moving forward and why should people uh, get a hold of that and, and join the subscribe to that? Yeah, well, one of the things we're going to do is every day we will get into the Premier Study Bible so it will become a daily Bible study that's available and they'll be archived so people can go back to them also. And um, we will just go through it. We'll go through the, we'll go through the notes in it. Uh, we'll talk about them. The, the truth of the matter is, is as, as any Bible student knows, uh, the notes in this Bible, they are very, very good. They're done by people just, I'm just impressed at their scholarship. However, um, there's probably a uh, hundred times more you could put oh, in yeah. there, but your Bible would be this thick, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so yeah, you'd need a little wagon to carry yeah. your Bible with. Scrolls. Exactly. <laughs> so, so um uh, when we go through it, we're going we're gonna to get into some of those things. Just on, on any of these things, there's, there's thousands of wonderful things to talk about in the Bible. So that's, what, that's the main thing we're doing on all things apostolic. Second thing we're doing is we are introducing uh, other things that are going on, like Scholars Village and uh, Hall of Faith um, and the BAM Center. And these are all uh, ministry things that are extremely exciting and people's going to want to know about them. So over a period of time, we'll be introducing those things also. So God Quest, we talk about, is about the journey, the quest to find what God's doing, to find where we fit. That's the journey we're on. How do I fit? What can I accomplish? What can I do? And underneath all of your searching, underneath all of your efforts in this quest, the Word of God is going to provide more strength and foundation for everything God is leading in, you into. So I am so thrilled, Dr. Wilson, that you were with us on God Quest. I look forward to other discussions, and maybe we'll zero in on some particular topics in the future, and we want, definitely want you back. We're excited about all things apostolic and these other things that are developing. And I'm excited to join with you, so stay tuned. Thank you for joining us on God Quest. Hey, subscribe. Tell somebody about it. Share it. Get the word out. In this crazy world we live in, we need the voice of truth to be strong and loud. So get God Quest out there. We look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you.